Welcome to the last and final day of the Technion Summer School on Privacy. Today, I will be presenting the second, Ram Gilad Dacha, who is going to present the first talk. After his talk on privacy preser preserving machine learning, we will have two talks on anonymous communications, uh, one by Sophia Selly on OTR version four, and one by Claudia Diaz on Nixnet. Then we're going to have Alessandro Acquisti talking about economics of privacy. And finally, we're going to have today summarize everything, a panel on regulation of privacy. Now, any questions to the speakers can be put into the Q&A or into the chat and we will uh, communicate them to the speakers who can also read it on their uh, screens if they have the capacity at uh, talking and reading at the same time. Hopefully we'll have the speakers who can read and present at the same time. Um, and now it is a great pleasure to have Ran Gilad Bachrach uh, to discuss privacy preserving machine learning. Ran is actually a professor at the biomedical uh, faculty at Tel Aviv University. He was before that a researcher at Microsoft Research, where he worked a lot about topics related to privacy and machine learning in the context of medical data. Ran, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just start the presentation. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, all technical aspects work well. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, privacy and machine learning. Uh, and let's uh, start with a little uh, story, imaginary story. So imagine you are a data scientist. You, you are now feel at the top of the world. You just developed uh, just the best machine learning uh, model ever. This is a machine learning uh, model that uh, if you give it uh, a DNA sequence, it can just uh, predict whatever diseases you might have in the future, what food will do you best, and it's just great. It's nothing that anyone have seen, uh, seen of before. And you just put it as a web service out there and you expect people to send their DNA, you'll run the, your model on, the, on their data and you, you, you already feel the money pouring in from all the people that will be paying you for using your model. But you're surprised. No one seems to be using your model. And the reason is people are not that eager to send their DNA or any other sort of private uh, data over uh, to your web service. So the questions uh, we're gonna ask today is first of all, what are the risks of uh, data sharing for, for machine learning purposes? Are people rational when they're not sending their data over to your unbelievable model or uh, and, and we'll look at different aspects of these risks uh, about the data collection, at uh, training, inference, aggregate statistics, and all sorts of things that uh, we do in machine learning. And then we're going to look at mitigation techniques. What, what technologies are out there to help us to reduce these risks? And, and I'm going to say upfront, there is a big gap between the risks and what the mitigation techniques that we uh, we have. So there are still things that we don't know how to solve, and, and this is what we do in our research, trying to close this gap. So let's start by talking about these risks. And I'll begin now with a real story that happened 15 years ago already. Uh, back at the time, AOL was uh, the one of the biggest uh, uh, search engine providers that were there were internet providers, but also search engine providers. And as a service to the research community, they uh, um, they published search logs. So search logs were anonymized logs. Uh, they look something like what you see here. So you have an anonymized ID, uh, queries that people issues, and and whenever they clicked on something, you see what uh, what did they click on. So they published this data on August 4th, uh, 2006. Five days later, this was published in the New York Times. 
Um, and in this article, they described that they actually managed to identify one of the users in this data set, user number 4417749. And, and here's, here are some, some details on how they did that. So this person issued a, a query about landscapers in Liborne, Georgia, which kind of suggests that maybe this person lives in Liborne, Georgia. They had another uh, query about homes sold in Shadow Lake subdivision in, in this specific county, which just uh, uh, help us be more confident about our geographic identification. And they also issued queries about several people with last name Arnold. So we may suspect that uh, this person has this last name. So they, they are asking about their relatives and a query about 60 single men, which suggests that this person is about th this age and, and since she is uh, looking for men, she, so she's probably a, a woman. And now by looking at just the records of uh, the, the, this area, they found that there is only one person in this area, which is about this age and, and a woman, and this is Thelma Arnold. And they went to her, they called her and asked her, are these the queries that you issued? in the search engine and she answered yes. But you might say, okay, what's about it? Here are some other queries that she, she uh, issued that were published in this data set. So she was searching for termites. So maybe you're not gonna be so eager uh, buying a house, uh, hand tremors, nicotine effects on the body, dry mouse, bipolar, and dog that urinates on everything. So this is how the dog became, uh, became famous as well. Uh, so what you see here that this anonymized data set, supposedly anonymized data set, actually reveals a lot of private information and we can reveal the persons uh, on which, it, uh, it, which are relevant to this data. So here's how things unfolded. With this specific case, so as I said, on August 4th, uh, the data was released. August 9th, New York Times published this, uh, this article. Uh, August 21st, the CDO uh, stepped down. And by September, a class action was filed against uh, AOL. The problem is that, you know, as, as you all know, data is considered to be the, the new oil. Uh, many, pay, many companies leave out of the data that they collect. And as we see, this data is very sensitive. Even if it's anonymized, supposedly anonymized, we can identify a lot of private information from this data. And there are a lot of famous cases about it. So Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, we, we all uh, uh, are familiar with that, I'm sure. But uh, there is uh, the case of Netflix challenge. Netflix challenge is not what you see here. Netflix challenge was something that Netflix published uh, a data set similar to the one that uh, we saw from AOL. In the case of Netflix, it was just data about uh, uh, for an anonymized IDs and the movies that they liked, didn't like, and that was enough to identify specific people. And, and there are now the uh, results showing that even from DNA sequence, you can identify the name of, of people. And I think that there was a talk about it yesterday. And, and here is just uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg. This is a list of data breaches uh, that uh, I found on Wikipedia. As you see, there, there are so many out there. So the data that we collect for machine learning is already a risk. Now let, let's move forward. Let's say we, don't, we manage to secure the data when it's not gonna leak, we're not gonna publish for scientific research, we're just gonna use it to publish some aggregate statistics. So imagine we take all the people that are attending this talk today and we ask, what is the average net worth of people in this meeting? What can go wrong about it? It turns out that a lot. So for example, if I knew that uh, Elon Musk is attending, by the way, Elon, if you're attending, please say hi, uh, then by uh, computing the average net worth, since I can assume that most of us have slightly less uh, uh, profits than he does, then 
I can estimate his net worth. Another thing that I can do is, for example, if I know if I want to know what uh, uh, or Dunkemon's uh, net worth, I can compute the average uh, net worth, and then when he goes out for a second, I can compute it again when he's out, and the difference tells me his uh, net worth. So as you see, even if, when I aggregate about a large amount of people, I can still infer information about individuals. And actually, uh, the, the uh, US uh, Census of two, uh, 2010, they tried uh, to uh, actually preserve the privacy of people, but in, in a study they conducted in the last couple of years, they found that for about 50 to 70 percent of the people that uh, uh, that participated in the census, if you take just the public information that they published about uh, an aggregated statistic that computed over from the census data and were published, you can identify uh, private information uh, about about half of the people. So, okay, aggregate statistics uh, are are sensitive. What about models, machine learning models that we train from, from uh, uh, such data sets? Can they leak information? So it turns out that they do. Uh, this, this is kind of a nice uh, study that was conducted uh, three years ago. And actually they trained machine learning model to identify the data that was used in order to train other machine learning models. So kind of using machine learning to attack machine learning and what they, they found is that they can identify something between 70 to 90% of the records that were used in training a model. So imagine if, if a model was trained on data in which I participated in creating this data, they can with, with a, a high uh, uh, accuracy say that actually my data was used uh, in this, in, in, for training this model. And what, what is the, the risk here? For example, if the model was trained to identify the right dosage for uh, a certain disease, by knowing that my data was used for, for, this, uh, for training this model, they can actually tell that I have the disease because otherwise my data wouldn't have been used there. And in order to uh, conduct this attack, they didn't have to have access to the very fine details of the model. So they had just black box access to the model, meaning that they just can issue a query and see the response. They didn't get it. They didn't have a chance to look at the internals of the model. Nevertheless, this was enough to identify the data that was used for training the model. And another scenario in which uh, 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 there is a risk, this is actually the scenario with which we started. If we have, uh, we use machine learning as a service. So we started with the example that of putting a model out there as a web service and expecting people to send their data to this web service. Obviously we cannot tell for sure that the web service either maliciously or just by uh, uh, bad conduct uh, uh, would take this information and use it for other purposes. So if we want to put a, a, a web service that contains the inference model that was trained using machine learning, this inference model might leak our private information. So we talked a lot about the risks, and I hope that by now um, I managed to convince you that there are risks involved in, in uh, privacy risks involved in using machine learning. Let's move now to talk about some uh, mitigation techniques. So one of the uh, uh, things that people suggest, actually a lot of it is happening in the last two or three years, is using data obfuscation or even th synthesizing data. Meaning if I have a data set, for example, medical records, this is very sensitive data, and I want to publish it to make it, for example, accessible to uh, scientists, instead of publishing the original data, I'm gonna uh, synthesize data that has similar statistics, but does not come from real human beings. And therefore uh, it preserves privacy. And what you see here is lists of uh, companies, uh, startup companies, 
that are developing different tools in, in this uh, area. Um, MD Clone, Hazy, Datagen, some of them are Israeli companies, some of them are not. Uh, and most, most of them used uh, a technique which is called generative adversarial networks. So let me um, explain a little about it. This technique actually uses two neural networks which are playing a game uh, one against uh, the other. The one uh, network, uh, the one marked uh, in blue here, let me try to highlight it. Don't know if you can see that. Anyway, yeah, oh, now you can see it. Uh, this, this network generates, uh, for in this case, images, which should look like X, uh, legit X-ray images. So it's a neural network that is just trying to generate data. Uh, it could be in, in a case of generating X-ray images, it will generate X-ray images. In the case of, uh, uh, in a case of medical records, it could be generating medical records. Now, the other networks, the one that is marked here in purple, is trying to identify fake images from real ones. So what does it mean? Uh, this network, the purple one, gets in, in, in every cycle, gets two images. One of them is a real x-ray images from the data that we have collected. And the, the other one is fake, meaning that it was generated by this generative network, the blue network. And the purple network tries to tell the difference. It tries to see if it can identify which is the real image and which is a fake. And these networks, these two, the blue and the purple, are fighting each other. The, the blue network tries to generate images that the purple network would fail distinguishing between the fake one and the real ones. And the, and the purple network tried to do its best in identifying fake uh, images. And what we do is we train these networks simultaneously. So the generative network tries to become better at deceiving the purple network. The purple networks try to be better at identifying fa uh, fake images. And after a while, the purple network can no longer identify the fake images. At which point we can say that the, the images that the generative network generates are realistic. And then we can use them to publish these kind of images as representing how, in, in this case, X-ray images uh, should look like, even though they are not belonging to any existing human being. As an example, look at these celebrities. Uh, all of these images, which are look uh, very realistic, all of them were generated uh, using this kind of networks, they call GUNs, Generative Additive Networks. So none of these images represent the face of a real human being, but as you see, they are very, very realistic. And the idea is that we can, uh, for the sake of uh, generating all sorts of statistics or training machine learning models, we can, instead of using uh, data belonging to real human beings, we can generate these artificial data sets and use them for the, the rest of the process and, and therefore prevent the, the privacy risk. So a few points have to be said about it. First, uh, note that uh, um, this method, I don't know if you, I hope you can see everything uh, right. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. So it allows uh, data sharing uh, and it allows the entire data science process. And let me uh, explain what I mean by that. We're gonna see later methods that uh, uh, use different techniques and allow us, for example, to train machine learning models or to compute aggregate statistics but they don't give us access to the raw data. So they, they actually uh, give us, they, they create a sort of a proxy by which we access the, the raw data. Now, 
if any of you were involved in doing some some data science you know that data science involve a lot of work of going to the data understanding it and debugging it for example if you work on medical records it's very common for physicians to uh put the weight of some person in the in the place that they should have uh, marked the height and the height in the field where they should have the weight and if you don't have access to the raw data you cannot identify this problem and and fix it now the method that we just saw of this uh, this uh, uh generating syn synthetic data allows us to actually see raw data although it's not real humans data but uh, still it's it's the raw data and and think about potential pitfalls and and fixes for these pitfalls uh, other methods uh, don't allow us to do that so that's a, a, a major benefit on on the other hand these methods don't have any formal guarantees and not not they don't have formal guarantees to the security so for example we don't have formal guarantees saying that there is no private uh, private information leaking when you use uh, such methods because at the end of the day uh the data the private data was used in generating this uh gun model so does it leak from the uh, generated images it's not clear and to what extent and another problem is that the utility is not clear so it's not clear how well do these images uh represent true uh images so this is a very interesting and promising approach but it has its limitations to, to see what we uh, mean by uh the risk of uh, utility so you know although these images that we see here are very realistic um it is known now that that for example neural networks are very sensitive to small perturbations in images that we cannot uh see for example if you see the image on the left this is an image of a panda and a machine learning model actually says with high confidence that this is indeed a panda but if we add a little bit of of kind of pink noise that you see in the middle we generate the image on the right side for which uh the the model says that it's a gibbon a monkey with a very high uh, confidence although we when we look at it you know I can tell the difference between these two images they look identical to me so if we go back to the images that the gun generated although they look realistic they might have this tiny perturbation these tiny changes which are hard for us as humans to uh see but uh, a neural network model might be very sensitive to them so so far we talked about uh, uh how we generate data that would not be sensitive uh we saw some uh, uh positive uh, uh positive results and negative results and now let's move to how do we protect aggregate statistics so aggregate statistics meaning things like how do you know i want to publish average uh, salary of people and things like that but do it without infringing the privacy of individuals and here we have the methods of differential privacy that I will try to explain briefly. So imagine I have a database on the left and I have a, a query that I'm interested in computing, like computing the net worth of, of all the people in this meeting. And we saw already that this might be risky. What differential privacy proposes is that before the the aggregate statistics is brought back to the person who made the query it will go through a proxy this is the computer that we'll see we see below and this proxy will add a little bit of noise to the result so if the average net worth of uh, the people in this meeting is say 100 it will add a little bit of noise so it might uh, give the number of 102 or 97 or something like that so we lose a little bit of accuracy, but um, if the statistic is computed about over a large population, the amount of noise uh, that we uh, have to add will not be that substantial compared to the size of the population. So let me show you an example. 
So let's take a, a, a very simple case. Imagine I would like to compute the percentage of per, uh, Facebook users in, in the audience today. Uh, but I would like to preserve uh, your privacy. So I don't wanna know whether you're using Facebook or not. I just wanna uh, compute this percentage. So what we can do is something like that. Instead of each one of you telling me whether they're using Facebook or not, each one of you is going to toss a coin with a probability of heads being uh, 0.75. And you toss the coin, and if the result is heads, you're going to uh, give me the true answer. If the result is tails, you're going to give the, uh, the opposite answer. So for example, if I'm a Facebook uh, a user, and uh, if I'm going to flip a coin, and if the coin turned out to be a head, I'm going to tell you I'm a Facebook user. But if the coin was tail, I, I would have said, I'm not a Facebook uh, uh, user and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna blink an eye. So I'm gonna bluntly say the opposite result. Now it turns out if, if you do the math that on, on average, most people will, will say the truth. So if proportion P of the users use do, uh, of the people in the audience here do use Facebook, then on average, the number that I'm going to see, and you see the formula below, is going to be 0.25 plus one half p. Which means from the, if I'm just going to compute the average over what you told me, which some of it is going to be the right result, some, some of it is, is, the, is going to be the opposite result, I can still recover the, the proportion p of people that are using Facebook. However, for every individual, I cannot tell whether they're using Facebook or not, because you know, I asked you if you're using Facebook, you told me something, but you have uh, what we call deniability. So if you said that you were using Facebook, it might be that it's because uh, you're using Facebook, but it might be that you're actually not using Facebook and your coin turned out to be uh, tails. So differential privacy allows us to kind of uh, um, compute these kind of aggregate statistics with, without revealing in, uh, private information. And we can actually even uh, compute how much information we might be leaking from such a, a computation. And we can control it by controlling the, the different probabilities. So for example, if, I, if I'm, uh, I think that this procedure that uh, I just described is too, uh, is revealing too much information, I can tell you, okay, instead of using a coin that has a probability of heads of 0.75, please use a coin that has a probability of head of 0.55. And this will add much more noise. I can still recover the results. It's gonna be, I, I'm gonna have a larger variance, but, but nevertheless, uh, I can still get some value out of it. And you get the better protection of your privacy. And this method was presented uh, for the first time in 2006, and now it's gaining a lot of popularity. And actually the, the 2020 US Census is gonna be using differential privacy. It's gonna be the largest operation using uh, differential privacy. And basically it means that almost anything that's gonna publish, they're gonna publish from, from, the, uh, from uh, the results of the census is gonna be actually uh, gonna have some noise in it. So if they're gonna say that, I don't know, the uh, unemployment rate in the US or what have you is a certain amount, it's actually, it's gonna be accurate to within a certain uh, threshold. And the threshold is required to protect the privacy of the citizens whose data is, gonna, is, is used uh, in this uh, uh, census. So, we talked about aggregate uh, statistics. Let's move on and let's talk about protecting machine learning inference. So what we mean by uh, protecting machine learning inference. So this is the scenario that we talked about at the beginning. So imagine I trained a model, this model, uh, you know, in this case, uh, takes DNA sequences and makes some predictions. Um, for example, are you at risk of, I don't know, acquiring diabetes? Um, 
Now I put it in the web service and I'm shocked to see that people are not so happy to share their DNA. And as, as we saw before, uh, they are rightfully so in being sensitive about it. Because for example, if your DL DNA leaks, um, I don't know how many of you had the experience of their credit card number being stolen and, and having, go to, having to go to the bank and, 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 and have a new credit card and then go to everywhere that you made payment and, and, and uh, change the records. It's very annoying. Um, but if your DNA leaked, it's much harder to change your DNA, right? Uh, so if my DNA leaked, I have no way to generate a new DNA for myself which means that maybe when I'm going to um, go to my bank and ask for a loan, they will look at my DNA that they have uh, managed to acquire and say, look, it's not in your DNA to return the loan. And therefore, you know, I'm not, I might not be granted. So uh, actually uh, protecting uh, the, this kind of data is uh, 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 it is something uh, that is uh, uh, is required, and and we developed a method that allow us to do the following. So imagine I could take my DNA, encrypt it, and send only the encrypted version to the web service. So I'm I'm meaning here not not an I'm, I'm meaning real encryption. And I'm going to send it to the web service without the keys. And nevertheless, uh, we developed method that allowed the web service to apply the machine learning to this uh, encrypted data and send the results. But the entire process is being done when the data is encrypted. So what it means that the cloud cannot read the data. So the cloud the service cannot see what is my DNA or any properties of it. Uh, predictions are accurate. Uh, you would have gotten the same results uh, regardless if the data was encrypted or not. But the, the cloud cannot read not only the, the data, but even cannot read the results, the predictions that it made. Because the entire process is being conducted on encrypted data. And the only thing that the cloud provider can do is send me back the outcome, which is en encrypted, and I can use the private key to decrypt it and read the prediction. So this is kind of the cycle. Let me uh, explain it again, because it's uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, for me, it was magic the first time we looked at it. The, 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 I can make predictions without seeing the data on which I'm predicting. And I'm, I'm not only that I can't see the data, I can see even the predictions that I made. And I'm using here kind of real and strong encryption just uh, to clarify how strong they are. As, as you probably, many of you know, most of the encryptions that we use uh, today, for example, for online banking, uh, might be broken once uh, someone has access to quantum computers. However, the encryptions that we uh, uh, use here are amenable to quantum uh, computing as far as we know. So these are really strong encryptions, but nevertheless, they allow us to do it. And these are special kinds of encryptions that are called homomorphic encryptions. And I'm going to explain in, in a few uh, slides what does this encryption uh, mean and what do they allow us to do. So imagine your data uh, was a piece of gold and, and you wanted to go to a jewelry uh, to create a nice, uh, say, bracelet, but you you might be worried that uh, uh, the jeweler, while working on your day on, on your piece of gold, will take apart a few pieces uh, for his uh, own sake. So, kind of in our mind, we think of our data as being this gold, and we are worried that while making predictions, uh, the, the the web service will take a few private uh, information, pri pieces of private information, for later use. So this is kind of the analogy. And what we do when we have a piece of gold uh, and we want to protect it, we use this kind of uh, a chamber. Uh, so we put the, the piece of gold in this chamber, we lock it, and then we tell our jeweler, look, you can operate on this uh, 
a piece of gold using these gloves, but you cannot take anything out. So the jeweler can create the bracelet, but uh, the jeweler cannot take any piece of gold that belongs to us. And once a bracelet is, is ready, we can come and use our keys uh, to take it out. Homomorphic encryption allows to do the same. Some people say that the name homomorphic encryption is uh, it's named after Homer Simpson. Uh, as you see, Homer Simpson used this kind of gloves. Uh, so homomorphic encryptions. But actually what homomorphic encryption allows us to do is operate on encrypted data in the following way. We can take two uh, numbers, say X1 and X2 that we see on the upper uh, left corner. And we can obviously take these two numbers, add them together and encrypt. So this is what you see where I can always go uh, from the numbers, go right. And, uh, and add them and then encrypt with my favorite uh, encryption scheme. Homomorphic encryptions allow us to change the order of operations. So we can first encrypt the numbers and then do an operation on these encrypted uh, results, which will result in, the, in, in an encrypted message that contains the sum of these two numbers. So I can do uh, some operations over encrypted values. Another thing that I can do is I can multiply encrypted values. So in the same fashion, I can take two numbers, encrypt them, and then compute an operation that will result in a message which is the encrypted uh, uh, product of these two numbers. Now, let me just clarify, I can take this X1 and X2, encrypt them, and then send them over, then just the encryption of these numbers. The other side can compute this uh, multiply operation, which will result uh, in a new encrypted message, which contain the product of these numbers. But this other side didn't get to see the original numbers, nor did it get to see the product of these numbers. He just knows that this new encrypted message contains an encryption of the product of these numbers. So homomorphic encryptions allow us to do uh, sum and product operations. And why do we, is it so exciting? This was actually something that crypto, uh, crypto, uh, in, in the cryptography field people were looking for for decades. Uh, the interesting thing is that with just uh, sum and product uh, operation, I can compute almost anything. So I can, with sum and product, I can compute uh, basically the equivalent of uh, an end gate and an XOR gate, and almost anything that we do uh, can be casted to these two operations. So uh, in a sense, homomorphic encryptions allow us to do almost anything that we can think of, almost, it's not everything, but almost anything that we can think of over encrypted data. So that seems to be uh, just absolutely amazing. But um, as, in, as, as it happens in many cases, uh, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And, and the problem is that uh, homomorphic encryption is very costly. Uh, kind of a naive use of homomorphic encryption will take any uh, bit of information and convert it into an encrypted message of, of size of the order of one megabyte. Any operation on this data will take of the order of, uh, any kind of basic operation on this data will take of the order of seconds. So for example, if I want to multiply two 32 uh, bits integer, it might take me something like 10 minutes. So as you can see, uh, it's hard to think about anything practical that we can use, uh, we can use it for, uh, um, you know, some people have said that uh, homomorphic encryptions are just good for keeping uh, mathematicians off the streets. But actually, it turns out that if you uh, use it in clever ways, uh, you can actually do some uh, uh, pretty nice things with it. So we were working on cryptonets, which is methods of using homomorphic encryption to apply neural networks uh, to encrypt the data. I'm not gonna have the time to talk about all the details, but just give you kind of a sense of the journey that we went through. Uh, we started with uh, being able to make a single prediction 
on on a uh, kind of benchmark data set, the MNIST data set that we will use. We use a single prediction took us uh, about 20 minutes, uh, and we had an accuracy of 97 percent. And we went through all sorts of improvement. Uh, and four years ago, we were at the point that we can make a, a prediction with 99 percent accuracy at a time which is less than five minutes. This was a great breakthrough. Uh, you know, the paper that we wrote about it is my most quoted paper. Uh, it was a very celebrated result, but now we can do the same in two seconds. And, and we're still trying to improve these results. Still, you know, it's, it's great improvement, but uh, for example, making such predictions on data which is not encrypted is several orders of magnitude faster. So it, this is not something that you can use on your daily data, but for highly sensitive data, uh, uh, homomorphic encryptions can be useful. And actually, homomorphic encryptions belong to a family of encryption schemes that allow computation over data while it is encrypted. And let me do a little bit of detour to talk about uh, um, encryption schemes and map them to the world of uh, data. And, and machine learning. So we're all familiar with uh, TLS or HTTPS, which is uh, kind of this little lock that we see when we connect to a secure website, for example, to our online banking. And what uh, this encryption allows us to do is to encrypt data on transit. When we send over the data, we, from, for example, to online banking, we know that no one in the middle can look at our data. But once it arrives there, they can decrypt it and see whatever we uh, uh, sent them. We're also uh, familiar with encryption at rest, uh, things like BitLocker, that encrypt the data while it's being stored on our, say, hard disk, but uh, keep the data uh, decrypted otherwise. Uh, both these methods do not encrypt the data while computation is being conducted. So for example, if I send my data over to my bank and ask them to do a certain thing, <clears throat> they get to see exactly what it asked them to do, how much money I have in my account and all of that. So during the computation, the data is in the clear. The same for BitLocker or, or, or uh, encrypt, uh, encryption at rest, uh, the data is encrypted while it's on my hard disk but once I start using it, whilst it's, it, while it's in uh, the memory of my computer, it is, it is no longer encrypted. So it, as we saw, there are techniques like uh, fully homomorphic encryption, uh, abbreviated here as FHE, and there are other techniques. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna say a few words about uh, these different techniques that allow us to uh, keep data encrypted during computation. So remember for homomorphic encryption, we saw that we can do addition and multiplication operations uh, while the data is uh, being uh, is still encrypted. There are other techniques. So MPC, MPC is secure multi-party computation. This is a technique that was uh, developed, uh, introduced first in the 70s by Yao that allows multiple parties to uh, do a sort of computation over their encrypted data without over the data without sharing the data. So for example, imagine I wanna compute our um, average net worth, but uh, I don't want uh, anyone to see my net worth. I just, we just want to compute the average together. So we have multiple parties. We are the different parties in this case, and we wanna run a certain computation and MPC allows us to do that. So it allows us to do uh, to, to do a shared computation without sharing our data. And we'll see in a second how this translates to the problem of training models. Uh, there is another method which is called the secret shares, which, uh, which allows us to take a, a, a message and split it between uh, multiple places and do some a limited amount of computation on this uh, data while it's split it, uh, into multiple places. And recently, hardware manufacturers like uh, uh, Intel, for example, start developing a hardware solution for secure computation. For example, uh, for Intel, it's called SGX, Secure Guard uh, Extension. So these are kind of um, 
areas in the CPU which are guarded and anything that goes uh, out of this uh, area is automatically encrypted. Anything that goes in is automatically decrypted and the computation which is done inside uh, this area, it is done in the clear, but in a very protected enclave. Um, so um, this, this kind of methods and, and other companies obviously have their own versions of it. They have the benefit of being much more efficient in terms of uh, uh, being much faster, but they don't have the same um, security guarantees. And this is something important to understand about this entire field. Uh, when we think about uh, uh, securing data to make sure that no private information is leaking, we have to make a certain assumption about our, uh, the environment in which we operate. For example, in uh, some uh, secure multi-party computation protocols, we assume that we have multiple parties which are honest but, but curious. So what does it mean? It means honest means that if we decided on a certain protocol, so if we decided that this is a set of operations that you should be doing, then you are actually going to do this set of operations. However, you are curious. Curious means that if during this execution of this protocol, some private information is going to be leaking, you'll be happy to uh, make use of it. Uh, so this is honest but, but uh, curious method uh, kind of setup. There are other setups in which are which are malicious setups. For example, you assume that you know I'm going to cheat in every possible way just in order to be able to learn something about your private information. So if if the protocols tell that I should send you uh, you know the my net worth time ten divided by seventeen, I might send a very different number uh, just because it's going to uh, allow me uh, to gain some information about your private information. So whenever we talk about, uh, about uh, privacy and security, we have to think about what is our risk model? What is our trust model? Do we trust someone? Uh, do we not trust one? To, to, some, to what extent we, we trust them? And so on and so forth. Uh, the methods that we talked about, uh, methods like uh, differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, and MPC, have clear definitions of, uh, of these trust models and we can actually prove uh, their properties under these assumptions. Uh, for the hardware solutions, such as SGX, we don't have this benefit. And actually, there have already been presented some attacks uh, on, on these uh, methods. And the same apply, we talked uh, earlier about uh, uh, using this uh, generated uh, images or generated data, synthetically generated data. We don't have uh, formal guarantees to the level of security they provide. So let's continue uh, looking at this map. So we talked about here about uh, protecting data on storage, protecting data on transit, and the difference between that and protecting data during computation. Um, none of these methods protect the data after computation. And let me explain what do I mean by that. So imagine, um, you know, I done some computation, everything was done using encryption in its uh, strongest uh, form. But now maybe once I'm going to publish the results, someone can reverse engineer and from the result, infer something about me. And we already gave a saw example for that. For example, if uh, um, we compute our average net worth and Elon, who's been so shy so far and didn't show up to say hi, but I'm sure that Elon Musk uh, is in the audience today. So if, uh, if he is here and we're going to publish the average net worth, it's going to be easy from that to uh, infer something about his net worth. And so it means that even if we've done all the computation using encryption and so on, once we publish the results, uh, we're going to leak some information about, in this case, Elon Musk. Uh, and this is where differential privacy steps in. So differential privacy does not talk about uh, much about what we do during the computation. It talks about what we do before we publish the results. So this gives us a little bit of a map of the different uh, methods and techniques available 
from, from cryptography to protecting uh, information. And in, in most cases, we need to mix and match them. Because as, as you see, um, you know, if we want to protect something uh, during the computation, we uh, want to use one set of techniques. If we want to use uh, protect it after computation, we, we want to use a different uh, set of techniques. And if we want to uh, protect during this entire process, we're going to have to use multiple methods. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is about federated learning. And federated learning is about this scenario where I have a data which is distributed between multiple parties and I want to create a single model but without uh, having the parties sharing their data. So to illustrate that, uh, let's think about kind of the common scenario in machine learning. The common scenario in, in machine learning is that I have data which is organized as a table. Uh, Every row in this table is a record. For example, it could be a, a information about a certain uh, person. Every column is a feature. Feature is a property. So property could be a gender, could be uh, um, my net worth, could be anything. And I'm trying to use this data in order to build some, some model, some statistical model. However, in many cases, this table is, is not resident in one place. So for example, if I wanna create uh, 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 some uh, medical analysis, the data might be split between hospitals in, in different uh, locations. Actually, this is what happened uh, in recent months regarding the corona. The data, since it's a new disease, no one had much data about it. And, and we wanted to aggregate data from, from the different places, but since medical data is very sensitive, this is not an easy task to do. Now, the, the data might be split in, in two different ways. So one uh, option is that the data is split in, in a horizontal form, which means that each party has several records. This is a case of the hospitals that we just talked about. Uh, so maybe we have one hospital that have four records and not another hospital that has 12 records and so on. And the idea is that if I'm uh, the party one, I have all the features about the patient in, in my hospital, but I, don't know, I, I know nothing about patients that attended a, a different hospital. So this is a horizontal split of the data. But there, is, there are other scenarios. So for example, there are scenarios in which, imagine I wanna do uh, medical predictions, but I'm, I wanna use data coming from say, uh, social network to make st such predictions. So for example, if I want to make a, uh, a prediction that someone is at risk of making uh, uh, that forbidden uh, suicide uh, attempt, then uh, a lot of the data that might be relevant to that is actually on, on social networks, but these social networks don't know uh, medical properties of people that uh, uh, use them. So in this case, our data is split vertically. What it means that, you know, we all see the same people, but we see different attributes of these people. So social network might uh, know something about uh, uh, the party I've been to uh, last night, but they don't know uh, what is my, uh, I don't know, uh, white, uh, white blood cell count, uh, because this is something that only my health provider knows. And in order to train models, somehow I, I, I need to bring this uh, different uh, columns together. So this is why we call it a vertical split of the data. Regardless, we, we now have methods to do that. Regardless if the data is, uh, so the methods are different when we use a vertical split versus horizontal split data, but using techniques of secure multi-party computation, techniques of, of uh, differential privacy, things that we talked about earlier today, there is a growing field of, uh, we call it federated learning, of how to uh, aggregate this, uh, to create a model without aggregating the data. Um, uh, Google is using it, for example, in order to train its keyboard. Uh, so whenever you use uh, Google keyboard, the Gboard, uh, actually da your data is, using, uh, is used to uh, improve the keyboard, but they use these kind of methods in order to preserve, their, preserve your data, uh, your privacy, sorry, uh, when they are training these models. 
So uh, to wrap up, um, this was kind of a, a, a crash introduction to uh, privacy in machine learning. Uh, we talked about the risks, and I want to remind you that these risks appear in all the different stages of developing uh, machine learning applications. So starting from data collection, doing some aggregated statistic training models and, and during inference. And we talked about mitigation techniques. Uh, we talked about generating data uh, using guns or other approaches. We talked about differential privacy, uh, federated learning and different methods to uh, run computation over encrypted data. Uh, so we, we're starting to develop tools to allow us to preserve uh, privacy during this uh, machine learning process, but uh, there are still a lot of risks out there that we should be aware of. Uh, so um, this is about it. And let me now go over some uh, uh, questions that I was asked. It's a good time if you wanna use uh, the chat uh, to send some questions. Uh, so I was asked about the generated example. Let me go back to that. And the Panda example. Okay, so. Okay, so. Uh, I was asked is, is, shouldn't it be the task of the purple network to identify uh, the, these differences? Yes, definitely. Uh, in, but uh, at, at, at a certain point, we don't, we don't know whether, you know, maybe the, the purple network uh, failed to do so. So far, uh, we haven't uh, managed to generate uh, uh, networks that are not sensitive to these kind of an artif artifacts. And actually, there are some theoretical works that suggest that networks will always be sensitive to some extent. Uh, so um, this is kind of an ongoing field. There is a lot of debate about it. It, it comes a lot when people talk about deep fake, for example, uh, deep fake uh, videos. Um, you know, I'm guessing that many of you uh, have already seen some of the, the examples where they generate uh, for example, a video of Barack Obama saying something that uh, he never said. And there are attempts to try to build machine learning uh, model that will be able to tell apart uh, fake uh, videos from, from real ones. But it's actually, in, at least to, uh, in my mind, it's, it's a losing battle because exactly as you suggested here, once uh, there is a model that can uh, be used to distinguish between uh, real videos and fake videos, I can use it in order to improve the, the network that generates the videos and to make it resilient in the sense that uh, the model would not be able to tell the fake uh, um, videos from real ones. So yeah, that's, that's an ongoing battle uh, that is going uh, uh, to be uh, we're gonna see. Uh, I've, I always ask about the utility of the different methods. So, you know, utility is is measured in different ways. So, for example, when we talk about differential privacy, uh, utility uh, may mean how accurate are going to be my result, and there is definitely loss of accuracy when you add uh, a differential privacy. This loss is more substantial. Uh, when your data set is small, when the data set is very, very large, um, actually uh, the loss is not that substantial. I'm not gonna go over the exact details, but uh, the idea is that the amount of noise I have to add is, is fixed regardless of the size of the data set. And therefore when I compute uh, an average over a large population, this additive noise become uh, kind of meaningless. Whereas if I have a small data set, uh, it's actually substantial, but it's still something people are, you know, we study and trying to see how we can reduce this amount of noise because in, in many applications, it is uh, substantial. Uh, regarding the other methods, uh, the main bottlenecks are performance uh, in terms of, uh, for example, for homomorphic encryption that I talked about, it's usually the computation time, which is still orders of magnitude slower 
than uh, kind of computing in the uh, without encryption, which makes it unusable for for many applications. For secure multi-party computation is uh, usually communication. Uh, the amount of communication that has to be uh, used is usually substantial. The kind of the, the take-home message is it's we we don't have just kind of a solution that I can tell you look use that and all is good. But uh, for for many applications, especially if if your data is very very sensitive, we may have already the solution, and if not, uh, we are working on it. So I hope this helps uh, and. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Fran, for a wonderful talk.